our extremely uh, distinguished guest. Um, he's a professor of sociology at the University of Oregon. He's the author of so many books, I couldn't possibly name them all. Uh, but the most recent one, the Isaac Deutscher Memorial Prize, which many of you in Scotland will know was also won previously by Neil Davidson um, and awards the uh, best Marxist uh, book of the year analytically. He's also the author of Marxist Ecology and so many other texts. We couldn't really have a better uh, guest in any field, but particularly in the fields of monopoly capitalism and uh, the politics of nature and the metabolism with nature that Marx uh, notoriously described. So I'm absolutely delighted to be joined tonight uh, by Professor John Bellamy Foster. If you could all please give a virtual round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's um, a pleasure to be at the Havens Center uh, once again. I spoke to the Havens Center back in 1993 at the uh, invitation of Eric Olin Wright. And at the time I was writing on, on uh, global ecological crisis and I had just completed writing my book, uh, The Vulnerable Planet and I was uh, writing about uh, Marxism and ecology. And that was, a, that was almost 30 years ago. And, and uh, unfortunately, not much has improved since then. In fact, uh, we're in a far worse situation. Uh, the powers that be have not uh, done anything really to address uh, the, the scale of the uh, crisis that we're facing. Now, the uh, talk at the Haven Center in 1993, March 1993, was called uh, The Global Ecological Regime of Capitalism. And that's how I was thinking about it at the time of uh, The Vulnerable Planet, at the time I wrote The Vulnerable Planet, um, uh, which was published in 94. And the idea was that capitalism was not just an economic and, and social regime, it was an ecological regime as well. And we understood that uh, this was based in the nature of capitalist production, that capitalist production had an effect on the environment. We weren't um, able to, um, myself and others who were working on it at that time, were not able to articulate this fully in, in the early 1990s. It took about six years before the, uh, the metabolic rift theory uh, that Marx had developed uh, was, was uh, uncovered and, um, and uh, reestablished as part of, uh, of our analysis and allowed us to understand how uh, the, the ecological crisis was related to the alienation of nature, uh, how the economic and, and ecological contradictions came together in capitalism. So in, in uh, memory of that earlier talk, I've uh, entitled this uh, one, the, cap uh, the Climate Crisis and Capitalism's Alienated Ecological Regime. Now I wanna talk uh, about uh, three things, essentially. I wanna divide this talk into three parts. First is talking about the planetary emergency. The second is, is uh, Marxian ecology and what it has to bring to bear on the subject. And the third one is, is the ecology of the future because we have to look forward um, from the present point. How do we uh, create a more sustainable environment for, for humanity? So in terms of the planetary emergency, we, we often talk about it as though it's simply climate change. And that's understandable because climate change is such a serious and um, accelerating problem. It, it certainly has to be dealt with instantly, <laughs> right away, immediately. Uh, there's there's no, um, no alternative to that. But, but it's part of a larger planetary ecological um, emergency. 
And we can understand that uh, best as, as science does in terms of the planetary boundaries. Basically, uh, we, uh, we're now in the Anthropocene epic of, um, of the geological time scale. And the Anthropocene is defined by the fact that human beings are now the major factor in Earth system change in, in uh, alterations in the entire Earth system. This is a, a geological first. And uh, officially, we're still in the Holocene age. I mean, in the Holocene epic. I, I'm, and uh, the Holocene goes back 11,700 years. And it has been the period in which, which um, uh, human civilization uh, developed. And uh, it's been a fairly benign uh, climate and environment, but um, science has essentially concluded at this point, although it's not official, that the the Holocene has been replaced by the uh, the Anthropocene epic, which started around 1945 or the early 1950s. The usual markers are the the detonation of of the atomic bomb, um, uh, well, the detonation of um, of the first. Uh, the first nuclear detonation in 1945, followed by the, the dropping of uh, the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki later that year, and then the, uh, the H-bomb tests in the early 1950s. And these, this is our, um, our major marker for the beginning of the, um, the Anthropocene because of the radionuclides that were left behind. There are other markers like plastics, but the Anthropocene begins around 19. 45, early 1950s, the same time as the global environmental movement begins and not coincidentally. So we're, we're, we're in this period of, of the Anthropocene and it, started, it starts off as an anthropogenic rift in the environment, in the earth system as, uh, as uh, science says. Uh, basically, the, um, it's a, a rift, an anthropogenic rift in the biogeochemical cycles of the planet as a result of uh, the expansion of uh, the capitalist economy, uh, economic growth, and so on. So uh, this, this is, uh, is what defines the planetary emergency in many ways, but we have to understand it in terms of planetary boundaries. Now, there are nine planetary boundaries that have been defined by uh, science, and they essentially, uh, they're essentially uh, defined in terms of what constitutes a safe uh, place for humanity, a safe home for humanity uh, on the planet. And uh, they're defined in terms of the Holocene as the, the background. And we are crossing or almost all of these planetary boundaries and have crossed some of them. So climate change is one such a planetary boundary, but so is um, ocean acidification, depletion of the ozone layer, the um, species extinction. Uh, we talk about the sixth extinction, the sixth, sixth extinction, but it, it's also, um, we have to look at it in terms of the loss of biodiversity in general, the uh, disruption of the the nitrogen and phosphorus cycles, the uh, loss of ground cover, uh, particularly forests, um, the loss of fresh water desertification, the um, uh, you know chemical pollution, uh, radioactive pollution, and um, these 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 uh, planetary boundaries that we're crossing. Uh, all um, constitute threats to to humanity on a global scale. They're all they're all individually planetary emergencies, and they all have a uh, one common denominator, and that's the capitalist uh, world economy. So even if we were we were to uh, find ways to address climate change, uh, we and we and we have to. Uh, we also have all of these other planetary emergencies to consider. Ocean acidification has been associated with the great die downs in, in planetary history. So 
we we need to uh, deal with all of these problems at once. And it's important to understand then that climate change is only part of the problem. Now, if, if we look at uh, climate change itself, though, we're in a very uh, serious position. And that's laid out in the sixth assessment report of the in the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the sixth assessment report, the physical science basis was, was published in early August. And um, it's the most up-to-date, most uh, 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 sophisticated analysis of the problem and with uh, the backing of, of, of world science, the world scientific consensus. But, it, but even, um, oh, I think it was a couple of days before the, the, the part one the, the, of AR6, the sixth assessment was published, uh, the, there was a, a leak and, um, and um, uh, other parts of, there were leaks and, um, uh, part three, part of part three was leaked a couple of uh, days before that. Part three of the sixth assessment wasn't supposed to be published till March. And also we had a leak of part two of the, the sixth assessment, uh, which wasn't supposed to be published until February. Now it's, the leaks are very important. The reason that the leaks are occurring is that we're in such a serious place with COP26 approaching that um, scientists within the IPCC uh, in, the, in the case of, um, of the part three leaks, it was um, a science uh, rebellion attached to extinction rebellion that, that carried out the leaks. But the leaks are occurring because, because matters have become so serious that the scientists are trying to get the information out to us. Uh, while we still have uh, time to act. And it's also, they're also occurring because if you know the IPCC process, what happens is that the, the, the scientists uh, approve the, the, the um, assessment, like they, the scientists approve the sixth assessment, for example, which they've done, they've, re they've approved all the parts of it, but then in the process, the governments and the government representatives are able to come in and redact uh, the report, that is censor it, so that we don't get what the scientists are, are telling us. We don't get what is coming out of the process. We get something that is redacted and uh, censored by governments. And so in leaking the reports, they were trying to get out to us what the, what the scientists have actually approved and understand to be the problem before the governments are able to uh, censor it. So this is uh, very important. And so what does the sixth assessment uh, tell us? Well, the important thing, I mean, in, in part one tells us a great deal. And part, part one was, was published on, on August 9th. Um, and, um, it, it tells us that, uh, uh, well, uh, as the UN General Secretary has said, it's code red for humanity. But he was also he was also thinking of of the um, what the leaked reports reveal as well. The um, the the important thing is the shared socioeconomic pathways. Uh, that tells us, according to the IPCC, what they think is possible, their scenarios of, of uh, what is possible. And there are five scenarios, uh, five socioeconomic pathways that are dealt with in the report. And uh, the first one is, is um, optimistic, of course, and it's the best that um, we, can, we can hope for, um, according to the science. And uh, it's called uh, SSP 1.9. It's the most optimistic of the five scenarios. And it's the only one where, where um, we will, at the end of the century, according to the scenario, uh, be 
below 1.5 degrees increase in global average temperature. And what it says is that to, to um, reach, uh, to um, conform to the SSP1, this uh, 1.9, the uh, optimistic scenario, uh, the uh, carbon, carbon dioxide emissions have to peak worldwide within four years. We have to hold off reaching 1.5 uh, degrees Celsius increase until 2040. This is very important. We, we no longer can stay below 1.5 degrees Celsius for the entire century. I'll explain that. Uh, but we have to avoid reaching that um, marker uh, uh, before um, 2040. And we have to have net zero carbon emissions in, in, net, in 2050. We, uh, in these conditions all have to apply for us to stay below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Well, not, um, we won't be able to stay below, below it, but what will happen is that um, in this scenario is that we will, we will stay below one point, well, we won't reach 1.5 degrees uh, increase in, in uh, global average temperature before 2040, then we will rise the temperature will, will rise to an increase of 1.6. And then by the end of the 21st century or the beginning of the 26th, 22nd century, we will be able to get the global average temperature down to 1.4 degrees again. This is actually what science thinks is, is necessary. Uh, this, um, we used to think that two degrees was the the point of no return, the uh, point of irreversible, irreversibility, uh, which uh, is what, what um, the science uh, worries about, scientists worry about, because at a certain point, uh, things will get out of hand um, with runaway global warming, and, and we won't be able to stop it or the consequences. And uh, the um, our, our only you know, our best chance for achieving that is to stay be, uh, below 1.5 degrees. Staying below two degrees is the backstop, which is probably what they will bring to everything to in, in COP26. And, but um, staying below two degrees um, is very, very, um, the, that, that uh, goal uh, puts in a, us in a very, dangerous situation, a 50-50 um, um, situation of, um, of um, uh, running into extremely dangerous, uncontrollable climate change. So the, the um, science really says we have to stay below 1.5 degrees. The, the final guardrail is, is staying below two degrees. After that, there are three more scenarios and all of them are uh, that are um, considered and um, uh, socioeconomic pathways, and they all are uh, um, apocalyptic in, in very, in, to various degrees. Uh, that's not meant as pun. And uh, the, the, the um, final, uh, uh, the fifth scenario is, um, which we're really, um, we're really headed towards that. Uh, the fifth scenario, SSP 8.5, is is um, you know, the absolute um, uh, cataclysm. Of, you know, the, um, it's very apocalyptic. Is the um, the best estimate of of global average temperature at the end of this century, when many of um, people alive today will will still um, presumably be alive. The um, the best um, um, the the best uh, estimate is uh, that global average temperature will will be at four point four degrees increase over uh, over um, pre industrial levels and um, perhaps higher than that but the best estimate is four four point four but but the science tells us that we cannot um, maintain industrial civilization. 
um, if we reach for a four degree increase in global average temperature, industrial civilization will, will crumble. And if industrial civilization crumbles, so will our state structures, so will um, um, it, it will be absolute uh, disaster for humanity. There really aren't words to describe it. Catastrophe is, is not sufficient. So this is the, the situation we're, we're faced with. Now, what's interesting about the, the leaked uh, climate um, reports, the, the leaked uh, part two uh, and part three of, of, um, of um, the sixth assessment, um, the, the um, AR6, is that um, they tell us a lot that lies behind this. The, the, the second um, report is on impacts and the third report is on mitigation. Now, we actually need to know about mitigation. We have to know what we can do about this, what the scientists are saying we can do about it. But to um, have access to that, you have to read the leaked report, not the published report, because that tells what uh, the state were, were in. And um, the, uh, but in the part two report, it's very interesting. They have, um, that, that some of this has been been um, provided by the French news service as, as uh, quoted from the leaked part two report, which they have access to. We don't have that whole leaked report publicly, but um, they wrote um, in, apparently the, the um, uh, part two report says, life on earth can recover from a dramatic climate shift by evolving into new species and creating new ecosystems. Humans cannot. What they were doing, they were talking about the, the mass extinctions in history and they're talking about the sixth extinction and the fact that uh, it's, it may encompass humanity itself. And they're saying, look, we can't destroy life on the planet um, completely. We can maybe kill off most of the species, but we uh, we can kill our ourselves off and most of the species. But um, uh, life will come back, ecosystems will come back. It's just that the human species won't come back. Evolution won't do that. I think this is quite remarkable coming from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It shows you how serious they think uh, the issue is, and but. We have a lot from the part three report because both the summary for policymakers of, of the part three report and um, the, the chapter, uh, chapter one of the part three report, which deals with mitigation, were leaked. And uh, you can find them on the monthly review website. Um, I can give you more details on that later. But um, the, um, these leaked reports uh, represent uh, on, on mitigation, the, the part three represents a fundamental shift in terms of the view of the IPCC. They, they say that um, we can't, um, we're not gonna be able to make it particularly with the, the, um, the, the um, scenario one, but even with the scenario two with uh, two degrees as the, as the guardrail, unless we make fundamental uh, structural change uh, in, in our socioeconomic system, unless we have, uh, we carry out transformative change. They're, they're, they're basically saying that we have to carry out something equivalent to uh, an ecological revolution. And uh, their emphasis shifted uh, previously of the, the mitigation strategies were, were oriented towards, um, the mitigation strategies were oriented towards uh, the um, supply side to, um, to uh, technology, uh, you know, trying to find technological solutions because of course, uh, they don't want to, um, the establishment doesn't want to alter capitalist social relations. They want to, preserve the system exactly as it is. And, uh, and uh, so they're trying to 
they, for years, they've emphasized, well, we can solve this with simply technology and uh, with a little bit of help with the, uh, from the market. Uh, the IPCC report, the sixth assessment, the part three, the leak report, basically says this is not possible. Technology can't get us there. Uh, right now, uh, solar and wind power account for 7% of all um, energy use. We can't, um, we can't um, subs, we're not going to uh, substitute for fossil fuels fast enough by um, you know, the uh, pure technological route, the various um, and technologically intensive methods of, of um, direct air capture and, uh, and BECCS, bioenergy and carbon capture and sequestration don't exist at scale. Uh, they they, um, they uh, are not, the technologies are not really there and they have, they have um, massive consequences to the um, ecological system in, if imposed. And these things can't be done fast enough. Nuclear power, the IPCC report says, shouldn't be pursued and, and couldn't, solve, couldn't um, um, solve the problem either. So they've shifted towards uh, what they call a demand side strategy uh, that um, some uh, on in the particularly in the degrowth circles have promoted, socialist, eco-socialists have promoted. Uh, so, um, and where it's been shown that we can, we, with a demand side strategy, we can reduce uh, energy use by, by 40% while improving human conditions. And the IPCC report is, mitigation report is basically saying, this is the way we have to go. They're, they're um, drawing on, on uh, figures from eco-social circles are uh, quoting, referencing figures like Jason Hickel and Andreas Malm and uh, Andrew Gort Jorgensen and so on. Uh, people coming from um, uh, the eco-socialist analysis that we've been developing. And they say that uh, in the IPCC report, in the leaked report, that um, uh, um, many, uh, uh, many analysts now uh, believe that capitalism is un unsustainable altogether. And uh, uh, they, they clearly point in that direction that, that they support the view that capitalism is un unsustainable um, from the standpoint of, of, um, of um, the climate and, uh, and, and protecting humanity. And so we have to change the social relations. And in the uh, Part Three report, they they say that what we, they argue that we we have to uh, um, we we can't start any if we want to um, uh, conform to the the uh, optimistic target, the one point five degree target. We can't open any more coal mines. And we have to close all coal-fired, I mean, coal-fired plants. We can't open any more coal-fired plants. And we have to close all of the re remaining coal-fired plants within a decade um, across the planet. They, um, they argue that we have to create more sustainable cities, that we have to get rid of SUVs and, and gas-guzzling vehicles. Um, they talk about... Um, uh, of uh, what this can be replaced with, of course, mass transportation and, um, and lower energy use uh, vehicles. And uh, they, um, they argue for a just transition uh, on the standpoint from, for labor, but also for what we would say is the working class, but also focusing on vulnerable populations. They support, they support climate strikes they support the climate strikes that have taken place. They, they support the broad coalitions um, that are being built on, 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 the, on the ground. So this is a very different um, kind of IPCC report that really fundamentally, and I wish I had more time to talk about it, uh, conforms to what, what um, we have been saying and um, the um, within within eco-socialist circles, this is just 
objectively necessary now that um, that um, we adopt adopt a demand side strategy that um, that you know questions what we produce and what we consume, and it's very clear that in this analysis that it isn't just about it's not about consumers, it's about um, production corporations. They point out that um, uh, something like forty six percent of all um, GDP, I think, related to uh, trade from the less developed countries is is um, should be uh, counted as carbon emissions in the global north, uh, where the um, where the consumption is taking place. So this is a, a very a radical analysis, and um, and um, but but uh, science has taken us there. That's where we objectively are. That's how we have to build our movement. Now, I want to say some things about Marxian ecology briefly and um, in this context. And um, we, we, the, point isn't, the point isn't just to understand this, obviously, as, as Mark said, um, the point isn't just to understand the world. The point is to change it. But now we could add. The point is to change it before it is too late. We are in a we are in a objectively in what we would call a revolutionary situation, and uh, we have to change it um, before it's too late. And I have a thesis that uh, that the way we should we define a revolutionary situation, and I'll hopefully talk about this uh, later, is is. Uh, a revolutionary situation occurs when the struggle for freedom and the struggle for necessity coincide. There's always been a struggle for freedom, for liberation um, in class societies over thousands of years of human civilization. Struggle for freedom, uh, uh, of course, it um, goes in, in cycles to some extent, but, but it's always there, as most of you know. And there's also times when the struggle for necessity or a struggle for survival, when, when conditions impose on human beings uh, to such an extent that um, a survival is the issue. For example, Marx um, um, writing about um, the, the situation in Ireland in the post-famine years uh, said it was, it was it was a question of ruin or revolution because of the destruction of, of, um, of the ecology, the destruction of the agriculture and, and uh, the effects on, on the Irish uh, peasantry that it was a qu question of ruin or revolution. But a, a revolutionary situation occurs when, when the struggle for freedom and the struggle for necessity coincide. And I think we're, we're seeing that now at any rate, um, if we look at capitalist uh, capitalism, what we have to understand is that capitalist production is um, an economic class system. It involves um, the exploitation of, of labor through production, with all the socioeconomic consequences we know, but it, it's also an ecological system. It's uh, it um, uh, at this production production also is a transformation of our relation to the earth, and um, this is occurring uh, at the same time. And we appropriate from from nature or from the the universal metabolism of nature, as Marx called it, uh, in order to produce. And this is um, uh, this is the other side of production, and. Uh, we can have a destructive relation to human society um, on the economic uh, side, but we can also have a destructive relation to the earth on, on the ecological side and capitalism promotes both, uh, a sort of two-sided alienation. Marx introduced uh, three concepts that I think are, can be seen as um, his, his dialectic of the metabolic rift. He introduced, as I said, the universal metabolism of nature. He introduced this notion. He didn't talk just about nature um, as, as something apart from society, 
uh, na um, nature was a universal metabolism. The way we understand it in science today, um, all the way up to earth system science. He also introduced a concept uh, called uh, the social metabolism. Marx said that the labor and production process, and he was writing specifically about capitalism, but this applies trans historically, uh, the labor and production process is, um, is our a social metabolism with nature. That's, um, we, we transform uh, nature, we metabolize with nature um, through uh, production, through our, 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 our productive activities primarily in the broad sense. And, um, but when the social metabolism of a particular mode of production, such as capitalism in particular, comes into conflict with the universal metabolism of nature, with the, the uh, physical law, natural physical laws of nature itself, the, the um, requirements of, of um, a, a sustainable environment, when, when the social metabolism comes into conflict with that and becomes an alienated social metabolism, Marx talked about the alien, alienated mediation. We can talk about the alienated mediation with the earth through production. Then you have the creation of a metabolic rift, an ecological crisis and uh, that, um, which Marx explained first of all, in terms of the soil crisis in the 19th century when the food and fiber that was being shipped hundreds of thousands, hundreds and thousands of miles to the new urban centers where the industrial proletariat was located. Uh, this food and fiber was carrying the, the, um, the nutrients, the soil nutrients um, within it um, and uh, the, the, the nitrogen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and other soil nutrients. And this ended up polluting the cities rather than going back to the soil and, and replenishing the soil. And that kind of break, he called uh, a, an irreparable rift in the interdependent process of social metabolism between nature and society, a public rift. And uh, he, he um, understood this as an as a form of ecological crisis and pursued studies in that. And in recent years, we've, we've uh, recovered that notion of the metabolic rift and we've, we've um, used that method and, and expanded it to uh, understand uh, the ecological crisis in general. This isn't any kind of an accident. Marx was, was the first to introduce the notion of social metabolism and integrate that with an ecological analysis. But all of our system, um, systems ecology was, um, all, all of it um, has been based on the metabolism concept. And some of it um, was influenced um, um, by Marx uh, himself, um, you know, he had, he, uh, let's say through his, his close friend and um, E. Ray Lancaster, who was Darwin and Huxley's protege, but also Marx's close friend and became uh, the leading ecological critic um, in, in England in the generation after Darwin and Huxley. In fact, the leading um, British biologist uh, at that time and, um, and then this carried forward to Arthur Tansley's notion of um, the ecosystem. Uh, both both um, Lancaster and Tansley were Fabian style socialists. Uh, uh, Tansley utilized uh, uh, Hyman Levy, the Marxist mathematician systems theory concepts to develop ecosystem. But metabolism has ended up, uh, ha was the basis, uh, became the basis of of ecosystem analysis and then later e earth system analysis, well, biosphere analysis, earth system analysis. This is how we understand it. And Marx was already formulating it in this way. But the, the, the power of Marx's analysis was the concepts of social metabolism and, and metabolic rift, where he understood um, the ecological contradictions of capitalism as the other side of its economic contradictions. He understood how these were interrelated with each other. So it's only, it's only the analysis um, that's uh, 
founded on th this basis that that um, provides us with a complete uh, analysis of the ecological crisis, which is both biophysical and and social that under and and historically specific and understands it in relation to the exploitation of workers and the expropriation of land and, and bodies and uh, social reproductive labor. All of these things are integrated in the um, in the method that um, Marx um, introduced and that has been developed. Um, so this um, takes us to um, notion that I've I've promoted um, is the 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 environmental proletariat. How are we going to we um, going to um, deal with this? And I've I've pre presented um, a notion of environmental proletariat, which sometimes uh, seems utopian to people, but it really isn't. If you look at Engels's condition of the working class in in um, uh, written in in 1844 and 45, he was. Um, if you look at what Engels was writing about, he was writing about epidemiological um, crisis. He's writing about disease and uh, uh, health and you know, deterioration in people's health. Basically, how the working class was was being hit hardest by by disease due to the structure of capitalist class society. And Marx later said that this too was part of the metabolic rift analysis and that the, the periodic spread of epidemics was, was uh, uh, part of, it could be compared to the shipment of guano from Peru to the United States, which is the way he was referring to the metabolic rift, that they, they were similar problems. But, but in Engels's condition of the working class, he's talking about a period uh, he, just after the pod plot riots or um, uh, the, um, the uh, as, as the bourgeoisie called them, and that, uh, but the, the revolt um, uh, that it was occurring in that time and, and, and associated with Chartism. And he was seeing a revolutionary situation that occurred because people were struggling for their lives and their communities and their housing and their food and their water. At the same time, they were fighting factory labor and they understood that these things were related, uh, connected. And that's a materialist approach. And we're seeing this everywhere now. Uh, it's understood, especially in, in the global South, that uh, facing the kinds of horrible material conditions um, that we are, and they are especially, that um, when you 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 lack water, you lack food. Um, when when um, there's a spread of disease and uh, and uh, so on, that these things, these material problems, these problems of housing, housing and water and food and so on, are not separate from from the problem of exploitation in work. Um, uh, that expropriation of our resources and our lives and uh, enslavement in various ways, um, various kinds of expropriation are tied to exploitation. So there's an, an ecological and economic price, crises now are so interrelated that we have to see them uh, together. And this gives rise to an environmental a proletariat that's struggling not just for freedom, but for necessity. That's where the most revolutionary movements are, are emerge. So uh, I think, this is a crucial way of understanding our time. We have to fight for a society that has ecological sustainability, substantive equality, and sustainable human development. Those are actually all historical materialist principles. I have a, I my clock, I have about four minutes left. So I'm going to add something uh, more about um, the Anthropocene. And um, they, there's sometimes there's criticisms of the notion of the Anthropocene uh, introduced by science. I mean, the Anthropocene concept is introduced by science. And some people on the left have criticized it and saying, well, we should call it the Capitalocene. But that's really um, a category error. It doesn't, it may, it's a major mistake because it doesn't understand the critical nature of the Anthropocene. Uh, as, as it's in, been introduced to science. Um, and there's 
one way of looking at the Anthropocene is in terms of how it appeared. It appeared in the context of, of an a, um, ecological crisis. What scientists have called an anthropogenic rift in the biogeochemical cycles of the planet, which is actually the way, actually the way Marx um, theorized things in terms of metabolic rift. It's now, it's now um, a math, anthropogenic rift in the Earth system on a global scale. But the Anthropocene is not actually defined by that. That's how we're experiencing it. What defines the Anthropocene in science? What actually defines it is the fact that for the first time in all uh, planetary history, uh, human beings, uh, humanity, um, anthropogenic factors are the are the major force in change in the entire Earth system. It's not that I mean we we've affected um, we affected the environment um, from when humanity first rose, of course, emerged. But um, we're now um, now uh, human beings, the anthropogenic factors, are the main fat force in altering the entire Earth system, Earth si in, in Earth system change. And that's not going to stop. Now, if we follow down the path that we are now uh, in the uh, Anthropocene, under capitalism, headed towards the, the IPCC's fifth scenario that takes us to 4.4 degrees increase in global average temp temperature, what we're talking about then is an an Anthropocene extinction event in the terms of science. The Anthropocene will end in an extinction event which will take humanity with it. Uh, and uh, that's the only way, um, you know, the Anthropocene will actually be here. It will, it will continue to exist as long as industrial civilization exists and persists, right? Um, uh, assuming there is no Anthropocene extinction event, as long as, as industrial civilization exists, human beings will continue to be on this kind of razor's edge where we will be the main factor affecting uh, the, the earth system change. We can, we can have a more co-evolutionary sustainable relation to the earth system, to the planet and so on, but uh, there's no, no way that we are not going to remain the major um, uh, factor in earth system change as long as humanity exists from now on. Uh, so then how do we deal with that problem? I mean, the capitalist scene just sort of uh, doesn't confront that at all. It just sort of, well, we'll call it the capitalist scene. Well, what comes after the capitalist scene? I mean, it doesn't, it, and it misses that, that critical element that, um, uh, that we're in a totally different position and will be as long as industrial civilization lists, survives. The way to understand it, I think, is that um, we, um, uh, if you, we're still officially in the Holocene epoch, and every epoch is divided into ages, um, uh, usually three ages. And right now, we live in the Meghelian age of the of the um, the Holocene. Officially, we're in the Meghelian age, which goes back 4,200 years, and um, it it's it was thought by scientists to coincide with um, with some of the earliest um, uh, crises of human civilization 4,200 years ago, associated with climate change. And at that time, there's debate about this in science um, now, especially coming from archeologists, but, but that the Michaelian was designated in that way, it goes back 4,200 years. Uh, but, but if we're in the Anthropocene now, the Anthropocene has to have a first age. What is the first age of the Anthropocene? Uh, and, um, and the causes the, of that first age would be the same as the causes of the Anthropocene. Well, the, the first age of the Anthropocene, Paul, um, Brett Clark and I, who are professional environmental sociologists, decided to name the Capitolinian uh, the, uh, the uh, first age of the um, Anthropocene 
democracy and we say is the capital idiot and we we have an article we had an article in the um september i guess the the september 2021 month review called the capital linian where we we describe the capital linian which is is our uh age of planetary environmental crisis and we argued that um that uh it's it's based on it's a new ge it's a geological age rooted in capitalism and capitalism's um period of of destruction of the earth the, the point at which well, capitalism has become um, a danger to the entire Earth system. The age of the capital linian uh, starting in 1945 or in the early 1950s. But um, we argue that by 2050, we have to shift to a new age of a uh, new geological age of the Earth called the communion after community, uh, communal, um, commune. And uh, we have to create a sustainable um relation to the planet a, a period of sustainable human development of ecological sustainability and substantive equality but this can only occur by way of an ecological revolution um, based on the environmental proletariat uh conceived in in the very broadest sense um and um uh, i think that this is is the nature of the problem that we face marx talked about the chain of unit human generations we're we're threatening we're facing the breaking of the chain of human generations and the destruction of the lives of of the youth on the planet today if not all of us um and uh and certainly um the um destruction of the future john ball sartre once said uh, a barbed future is still a future um but what he really meant was um we can do the impossible Thank you. A wonderful note to end on there. Thank you so much, John. I'm sure everyone really appreciated that. And I'm sure it's inspired um, a lot of people to want to ask some questions. Um, what I'm going to do, if John doesn't mind, I'm going to take people in uh, threes. Um, if you could raise your hand virtually, as it's very difficult for me to navigate uh, 150 or whatever people at once. Otherwise, I have uh, Michael and uh, Pablo, just to say I will be operating a progressive stack. So if those women wanted to speak, I will uh, take them as well. But first, I'll take Michael. Uh, thank you very much, uh, James. And thank you so much. Uh, John from that for that brilliant um, uh, lecture. Um, I have a very quick question. Uh, since the IPCC report, has there been a notable increase in activity from the climate change denial slash delayist lobby? And if so, how can we counteract that lobby's uh, influence? Thank you. Thank you for uh, Michael for an admirably brief uh, question as well, which I like. Um, we're going to take uh, Pablo and then uh, if others would like to speak, uh, please do raise your hand. Can I remind you, if you do want to speak, if you could possibly put your camera on, that would be ideal as well. Thank you, Pablo. I can't hear you, sorry. I don't know if others can. Can others hear? Sorry. Can you oh, hear me now? Well, that's better. Yes, I can hear you now. Uh, so, sorry about that. Um, I was saying that I am based in Guatemala City, where I work for the public university. And um, I also spent some time in Scotland, as a matter of fact. So I'm really happy to you know, uh, listen to what's going on in, in, in Scotland these days. So thank you so much for this brilliant uh, presentation, um, John. Um, uh, I've been a, a fan for some years now. And, and I just wanted to, to, to ask you about this uh, uh, difference that you made between uh, capitalist, capitalist and, and capitalanian in terms of uh, epochs and ages, to what extent this actually um, captures um, the fact that, uh, uh, I mean, for those in the global south, we, we definitely have a differentiated responsibility in terms of what's actually going on uh, with this ecological crisis. So I, I was wondering uh, how we can actually include that in this notion of Anthropocene without being unfair, you know, to most of us who, frankly speaking, have very little to do with the root causes for uh, things like uh, uh, global, um, uh, uh, for climatic change and, and those things. So that's what I was wondering. Thank you. 
That's brilliant. Thank you. I'm going to bring in Rosalind. Oh. Hi, uh, let me just bring up my question uh, on my screen because I'm a bit drunk. So, um, <laughs> so it seems that part of setting our so uh, resetting our social relations around nature requires a new way of valuing nature, um, a new way of valuing nature to how capitalism currently does or perhaps fails to. So, can you talk about what contemporary Marxist theory? Sorry, my dog is whining um can you please talk about what um contemporary marxist theory has to say on nature and valuation and especially on alternatives to monetary forms of valuation three excellent questions there and thank you also for the intervention from the dog um john i'm going to bring you back in all right I, i'm going to try to give um quick answers to to questions that could take days <laughs> but um in terms of um, the first question, um, the has the IPCC report resulted in in uh, new contentions by denialists? I um, I think I think there is some, but we have to understand that the the outright climate denialists, those who say there there um, is no problem, that the, the Trumpists, for example, in the United States. That, that climate change doesn't exist, uh, they they are supplemented by and maybe even outnumbered by uh, the the liberal denialists who who basically say, yeah, there is um, there is uh, climate change, but the market and technology will take care of it, and that uh, we we don't need to uh, do anything to change social relations. That uh, capitalism is is the uh, solution. The, uh, and um, there's one, I was looking at the, the, uh, the Breakthrough Institute uh, the other day. They're, they're um, a liberal eco-modernist organization, or the prime think tank for liberal eco-modernism um, eco and capitalism can solve all ecological problems through technology and so on. And uh, I noticed that their director of energy uh, did a had an article published two days after the IPCC report, after the the physical science basis uh, one was report was published, and he said uh, climate that that carbon emissions were flattening and that the the uh, more serious scenarios were not uh, uh, so. Um, serious after all and but he did this mostly by he referred to ar5 from six years before rather than referring to ar6 the which had just been published um two days before his his thing was published and i think that was it was all designed to take the attention off of how serious it is by by um you know this notion that oh it's all it's the uh, carbon emissions are flattening we don't need to worry and this is a guy who um who actually in in his, in his other hat i forget his name uh, right now but uh, he he um, writes for carbon brief and says more sensible things there but from the breakthrough institute he um, he put out this thing that um, the problem is going away. Um, capitalism is flattening the carbon emissions, so not to worry. All of this is completely bogus in terms of the science. And uh, um, the, in terms of um, capitalism, capitalinian and Anthropocene and the global south, um, the, the, um, I think the, uh, the important thing from the standpoint of the global south is how imperialism is brought into this. So I wrote an article with um, my colleagues, uh, Hannah Holman and Brett Clark for a month review, I don't know, maybe a, a year ago, uh, called uh, Imperialism in the Anthropocene, explaining how uh, the uh, Global South was being, being uh, particularly affected. And what was unique about this, this article was that we don't usually talk about um, the, the geographical or geophysical aspects, but the science tells us 
that the low latitude countries are much more affected by climate change. And we have to start taking this to in consideration in our analysis, as you know, they, um, as the mainstream does, we have to understand that there are certain countries, which uh, regions of the world, which for no fault of their own, are really on, on the front line with respect to climate change, particularly in the low latitude uh, regions and islands. So, and it's mostly the global south, of course, since it's low latitude and, uh, and um, we have to understand uh, that this is further complicated by imperialism, that imperialism always hits the, you know, is, is directed at the global south. And, and uh, just as there's economic imperialism, there's ecological imperialism. And we also need to recognize, and this, argue, this um, article explained, that ecological imperialism is actually being planned in the context of the uh, climate crisis. So we, we explored the, the military and political strategies, imperial strategies that are being introduced in the United States to take advantage of the climate crisis and the ecological devastation of, of the global south in order to expropriate more resources, more control, expand imperialism and so on. And we did this based on, on um, government reports and, and uh, what the Pentagon was saying. So we have to be really uh, understand this. We have to understand that actually if we're going to combat climate change and this whole problem, it's where, where um, uh, the, the um, struggle for freedom and the struggle for necessity uh, most coincide that we're going to see, um, you know, that's going to be the front line of the conflict. And it's, it's in the global south. Uh, we all are involved and there'll be struggles all over the world, but the global south um, for all of these reasons is really um, the, um, the critical point of change. It's um, the critical point of, of revolution uh, in, in um, our day, as well as in the 20th, uh, 20th century. So uh, there, there are ways in which um, uh, that um, the issues fall quite differently on different hemispheres. The, um, in terms of new ways of valuing nature, I did a book uh, recently with, um, with um, Brett Clark called The Robbery of Nature. That, that deals with this, that uh, the, when Marx was talking about the metabolic rift, he also talked about the robbery of nature, that is, or the expropriation of nature. The expropriation, he talked about the expropriation of nature, he talked about the expropriation of human bodies, slavery is the greatest example of that. And uh, we, we, um, we have to, um, but we have to understand that um, that um, nature is basically being robbed or expropriated in the sense that we are not following uh, processes of reciprocity or sustainability. We're not um, um, maintaining the earth, and we have to have a, a conception of community with the earth. We have to enlarge our, our notion of of community to relate to the earth as a whole, and um, and um, you know, Marx actually developed the most radical conception of sustainability ever ever developed, um, where he, he said, um, "We don't um, own the earth. Um, nobody, um, um, nobody owns the earth. Not all the people in the world um, own the earth. We only hold it um, basically in in trust for uh, the." chain of human generations. He, he defined it um, in precisely how we define sustainability, but in a more far more radical way. And um, that's the way we have to think. It's not question an abstract concept of value. Most of our concepts of value are taken from, from the commodity economy. And certainly we have to have an intrinsic value, a sense of intrinsic value of nature. 
But really that comes down to having a community of nature, a sense of sustainability and reciprocity, and um, not in terms of an abstract concept of value derived from a monetary or commodity economy. Thanks, John. Um, could I take any more questions? Um, we have some people, please do feel free to put things in the chat and I am happy to uh, read them out. Uh, we have, um, is it Vren and Vicky? Apologies if I pronounce your name wrong, uh, and that goes for all, of course. Um, but I'll take Vren first. Thank you. Um, let me just put that. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I, my question is actually just a, a repeat of, of a question that I heard earlier. Um, and that is, uh, I want to come back to the problem of the capitalist scene and the Anthropocene, because I wanted to understand the stakes in that debate. Um, because if I understand what you said um, correctly, it seemed like the periodization for what some people are calling the capitalist scene and what you're calling the Anthropocene is, is very similar. That both the Anthropocene and the capitalist scene, which if we understand the Anthropocene, as you were saying, is when the human beings begin to make more of an impact or, or in, and so on, that seems to be the same as the capitalist scene when capitalism emerges, right? And so that in, in both cases, it seems like the object of critique is capitalism, that we're not going to be able to solve the environmental issue unless we overcome capitalism. So I was wondering how, what the theoretical stakes are in making this distinction, if you could sort of outline that a little more. I mean, maybe this is too large of a question, but 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 I was wondering just to pick up on what you were saying already. Does that does is my question clear? Brilliant. Okay, yes. thank you. We will uh, let John come in on that in a second. But firstly, if I could take Vicky, please. Thanks. Um, as time is very short, and uh, I think most of us here are persuaded that um, well, we need to get rid of capitalism, and John raised the the issue of you know our hopes uh, are in the environmental proletariat and i think that's right but um it, it seems like we're the environmental proletariat is quite a long way away from where it needs to be sort of ideologically so i just wondered i mean i think we can work on different small projects to get it closer for example um the rnt union has just had its conference and there was a, a ideological battle there and they managed to persuade them to take a more environmental stance than in previous years but i just wondered if john had any thoughts on how we can get the the insights and the theory and the ideas that you're talking about into working class organizations thanks Brilliant question. Um, I've got time for uh, one more question, if anyone would like. I think this will be our last round, given the time, and we want to let people go at half seven. So would anyone like to uh, ask a last question? Okay. Oh, yep. Okay, brilliant. Uh, we have the SANE Collective. Hi there, it's, it's, it's Mark Langdon here. The same collective is solidarity against neoliberal extremism. So I think I'm amongst friends. Uh, um, just on, on that kind of point about getting these issues into, uh, into the working class consciousness, I'm interested in John's, John's thoughts about the appropriation of the education system. You know, the, the mainstream education, not just higher education, but I'm talking about, you know, right through primary and, and secondary, not just in, in countries like Scotland, but across um, Africa and the way that education has been neoliberalised. Uh, and if you take a country like Scotland, where you still got a highly unionised workforce, but still very complicit in reproducing the same kind of capitalist vision of, of future. So I'm just interested if John has, because I know that there's a lot of um, th there's a lot of activism in the states around these, these kind of issues as well. So I'm interested in how that, yeah, his, his thoughts on how that might play out. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, and finally, John, uh, before I ask you to come back on these excellent questions, um, there's another question in the chat regarding the nature of China. 
um, its carbon emissions, its contribution, um, and also perhaps its relationship to debates about capitalism and socialism. Uh, so perhaps you'd like to have some thoughts on that conversation in the chat as well. Um, but I'll let you come back in um, if that's okay with you. All right. Um, in terms of the capitalism and Anthropocene, the, the periodization is not the same. Uh, the capitalism, uh, we all agree, came into existence in the middle of the 15th century. This is what Marx argued. This is what world systems theory argued. And, and it went through various stages like mercantilism and competitive capitalism, monopoly capitalism, and so on. But, but capitalism came into existence in, in the 15th century. The, um, but um, the Anthropocene, according to science, comes into existence in, uh, at the end of the Second World War, uh, basically with, the, with uh, the first nuclear detonation and with, with um, uh, the spread of radionuclides with uh, the H-bomb tests and the plastics and so on. This is, and you see the, the great acceleration at that time. So there's a, um, a qualitative change in the human relation to the Earth system. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a threshold effect. What Engels called a quantitative change um, leading to a qualitative transformation, they're arguing that uh, that occurred in, in the um, uh, late 1940s, early 1950s. And that's when Anthropocene was into effect. And the Anthropocene has to do with human beings being a force of change of the entire Earth system. To understand this, you have to have a concept of the Earth system, which I, I can't explain to you now, but it's not just the environment. It's not just affecting the environment. It's infecting the entire Earth system, which is bigger than the biosphere, of course. Uh, and this is um, what defines the Anthropocene, the human um, beings um, becoming uh, uh, the force in the change of the Earth system. So um, the Capitalocene is, um, nobody agrees. I mean, the Capitalocene was a kind of one-off. Uh, um, Andreas Malm first introduced it, and it was um, just a notion. Oh, let's call it the Capitalocene rather than the Anthropocene, because it's really capitalism that's causing this, which made a certain amount of sense. But the problem is that even if we, we get beyond capitalism, we're still in this fundamental situation that defines the Anthropocene according to science. And that is that we are going to remain the major force in earth system change, even in a socialist society. And so we have to have an understanding of that. What we really have to do is, you know, we, we want to stay in the Anthropocene because if we stop, um, <laughs> the only way we would stop being a major force in affecting the earth system is this, if, if we destroyed industrial civilization and ourselves. So it's a question in the scientific understanding of this, um, the um, developed by geologists and, um, and physical scientists generally that we, um, you know, we, we need to find um, a way with, to survive within the Anthropocene in that context. So it makes sense to go to the level of ages and understand that we're in the Capitolinian age, which is an age of an anthropogenic rift an actual anthropogenic rift in the Anthropocene and try to find our way, get to another uh, phase by around 2050, a great climacteric um, ecological revolution, which will create a, um, a, a different geological relation to the earth, um, which we're calling the communion um, based on, on a, a socialist society. Uh, uh, rooted in, in sustainable human development, ecological sustainability, um, substantive equality, that kind of society. So what we need is an analysis that's, that's in line with the science, um, but also builds on, on the critical basis of Marxian theory to take us forward and to organize our struggles. And so that's what that's all about. Um, 
uh, the capitalist concept doesn't really help in that respect. In terms of the environmental proletariat and how to get the the um, ideas to uh, the working class might be, you know, one thing. I'm glad that um, that question was asked by uh, Vicky. I think uh, because one thing I skipped in my talk was any mention of um, of um, the the IPCC report, the 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 physical science basis report that um, was published. Uh, emphasizes that we are now in the 21st century going to see all sorts of compound events like uh, heavy pre pre precipitation, uh, floods, um, uh, the <laughs> um, hurricanes, the, um, the we're going to see desertification, loss of fresh water, uh, the uh, droughts, uh, the breakdown of monsoons, all of these, these, these extreme weather events are developing and they're compounding. We're going to experience them in compound form. And this is going to happen. This is already beginning to happen. And this is the future in the next few decades. This is the future in the 21st century, even in the, in the most optimistic scenario. We're facing extreme threats to hundreds of millions, billions of people, even in the most optimistic scenario now. And we can't turn sea level rise around. It will continue to rise even under the best circumstances throughout this century and maybe for a millennium, depending on uh, what we do. So we have to understand that people are going to be uh, facing much more extreme conditions, whatever we even uh, if we do, um, if even if we um, get to uh, net zero by 2050, even if we do all these things, and this is going to wake people up. The 20, you know, um, Mark said 20 years can occur in a day. Now, revolution is all about the acceleration of history. The um, there is going to be massive change occurring. Nothing is stable at this point. And we have to intervene in this. We have to intervene in a way that protects people. Um, Eco-socialists have to be involved in protecting people at the same time that we struggle to protect the planet as a, uh, as a home for humanity. And in this context, I think, uh, yeah, um, in this context, in this ground level context, we will, um, we will um, be able to uh, get through I mean, the, the working class, not get through the working class, but the working class itself will appreciate the issue. In the United States, the, the population that is most concerned about climate change in all the surveys is the black population. Why? Why are they most uh, concerned about climate change in the whole uh, US population? It's not because they are more endangered um, um, well, they are more endangered, the more vulnerable in some ways the, to climate change. But they, the, the, the real factor is that they experience environmental injustice in their everyday lives, which gives them this material insight into the whole problem that the white population um, lacks. And uh, of course, and also they have less vested interest in the system. So. Ingalls in his condition of the working class said when he was describing what was going on, he called it social murder. Uh, if we want to get through the working to the working class, we have to talk about the social murder that's going on. I mean, the, um, the leading, some of the leading um, medical journals in the world have taken up Mark Engels' concept of social murder in recent years, but the left hasn't, um, the socialists haven't. Let's talk about social murder, talk about why this is happening and ha happening um, principally to, uh, to the most vulnerable, of course. In terms of the third question on, on um, working class consciousness and the appropriation of education, yeah, we have to struggle over education. Uh, I, I don't know, you know, I mean, it's, it's a question of, of, of struggle. We have to fight very severely for education. The reason education became more progressive everywhere in the 70s and 80s was because of the, the struggles in the 60s and the 70s that um, carried it all the way through the schools and into the universities. And eventually that subsided um, 
quicker than we thought. Um, and and he, with, with Thatcher and Reagan, it began to go the other way, but, but it was the struggles that created the possibility of progressive education. When I was young, uh, there were, um, there are only, um, was only um, one Marxist economist um, tenured in the United States. And um, now, um, and now, although it's, it's not fabulous, um, uh, Marxist theory has a place in the university. But I'll give you an example in, in with the, um, the uh, COVID and pandemic and the murder of George Floyd, actually the police lynching of, of George Floyd, police public lynching of, of George Floyd, um, we had massive protests in the United States, um, biggest since the Civil War, uh, which really should say a lot. And what was unique about these protests is that they involved crossing the color line. The white population and particularly white working class and white youth, white, um, particularly white youth crossed the, the, the picket line and got behind a black movement and a black struggle. And this is unprecedented uh, in, in US history. Uh, so, um, you know, at least since the 17th century, practically, maybe uh, it, it's, it was absolutely unprecedented. And um, my, my department um, at the university had been talking about um, hiring um, an African American, I mean, well, um, male scholar. Uh, it's, um, African American males are a little considered a little bit more dangerous. Been hire, hi, talking about hiring an African a male, uh, African American male for some twenty years, you know, or, or I, for for quite a long time since, and we've only had one in um, such hire in our history, and um, finally the faculty got behind the the thing because of the George Floyd protests and united to and with the students to do such a hire, to do um, a special hire and get somebody. And so they happened to hire a Marxist, black uh, eco-socialist, Julius McGee, one of the, the great, I think gonna be one of the great uh, social scientists in the United States and the world um, as a result. And, uh, and um, I, you know, I think that wouldn't have happened without the protests. If we want to change the education, uh, the appropriation of education, we need more student protests. We need faculty protests. We need uh, walkouts. We need teach-ins and uh, and um, give them hell and um, and um, call the call um, you know the question on the hypocrisy. And, uh, and what better issue than climate change? How many classes say anything about climate change, right? So there's a strategy, it's an old, age old strategy. Um, when, I, when I grew up, they called it cla the class struggle. That's what we need. Thanks. Thank you so much, John. If everyone could give a quick virtual round of applause, please. Uh, I think there's a lot of love for the talk overall and the uh, comments. Um, I think people really appreciate what you had to say. Apologies that we don't have more time. What I'd like to do is urge you all, if you are in Scotland or the United Kingdom, uh, to make your way to Glasgow for the protests. There is a list that Pete has posted up on the Contra website of all the upcoming actions that are available for you to participate in. So please do get involved with the struggle um, and with all the other struggles, including the trade union struggles that are happening in uh, Glasgow right now. I hope you'll all agree that we should be supporting that as well. Uh, thanks again to John and thank you to the Haven Wright Centre for Social Justice at the University of Madison, Wisconsin. And thank you to uh, CONTA, the Scottish Marxist Journal, which has taken on the Scottish establishment. Um, so if you want to find out more about the uh, upcoming lecture series, which include David Harvey, Costas Lapavitsis, and many other brilliant speakers, please do visit their websites. Please do support independent media by uh, visiting Conta 
and if you can help, uh, helping out with a few quid a month. Um, and otherwise, uh, it's been an absolute delight to have you all here. Um, I'm sure you've all really enjoyed the talk and the questions. Um, and we'll see you again, hopefully, very soon. Thank you very much.